Today, Galileo Galilei is universally seen as a pretty good dude. He was smart, and he's the main character in a lot of great stories. Now, in a lot of the stories, he's the one who invented the telescope, but that's not actually true. And he's the guy in a bunch of stories who drops things off the Leaning Tower of Pisa to prove something about gravity. That story, it's kind of true, but not totally. The story I'm going to share with you today, though, that's totally true. Signor Galilei, we are of the Senate. In his time, which, by the way, stretches from the late 1500s to the mid-1600s, Galileo was very highly regarded. Signor Galilei, I have the honor and the pleasure to inform you that in recognition of your services to science, the Senate has awarded you the Chair of Science at the University of Padua. He was a professor, a writer, and an astronomer. Galileo made a ton of discoveries in his day, big ones. He found moons around Jupiter that we now call the Galilean moons. He found the rings of Saturn. He observed that Venus has phases just like the moon does. But the thing that got him the most attention was his support for the idea that the Earth was rotating around the sun. This was a very contentious issue at the time because a lot of people were really invested in the geocentric view. That's the idea that the Earth, geo, was the center of the universe and that everything revolved around it. The people most invested in that theory were the leaders of the Catholic Church. When Galileo published his observations and calculations in support of the heliocentric view, helio meaning sun, with the sun at the center of things, well, that did not go over well with the Catholic Church. Now, in the popular telling of this story, the Catholic Church calls his statements an affront to God, and they call him before the Inquisition. Do you curse and despise your crime in teaching that the earth moves? And that the sun is the center of the universe? Galileo refuses and is put under house arrest. You have been found guilty, and the decree of this court is as follows. You shall renounce the heresy of your teaching. You shall repeat the seven penitential psalms each day. You are to be a formal prisoner of this office for the remainder of your life. And my favorite part is that just as he's placed under house arrest, he utters the best quip of all time, eppur si muove, and yet it moves. In other words, you can throw me in jail if you want, but the earth is clearly moving. I can see it, you can see it, everyone can see it. You can say the earth sits still at the center of the world, and yet it moves. It's a good line. It's so good that there are science nerds all over the world with tattoos of that phrase on their bodies. And if you're ever in a debate with someone about science, it is definitely what you say before you drop the mic and walk off the stage. A poor se move, motherfucker. This version of the story paints Galileo as a rebel fighting against the establishment. And eventually, our plucky hero is proven right and we all rejoice. But is that what really happened? Well, no. One really important fact is that Galileo isn't the one who first proposed the heliocentric theory. The idea that the Earth revolves around the Sun came from Nicholas Copernicus, who published the idea 70 years earlier. And the Catholic Church, well, they weren't that bothered by the claim. In fact, there was a strong bond at the time between the learned men of science and the leaders of the Church. Galileo's own words reinforced this idea. He once said, There are two truths. Science and scripture can never contradict each other. Now, that would have been fine if he'd just stopped there, but Galileo added one more sentence that got him in a lot of trouble. It is the task of the interpreters of the Bible to find the meaning of the words that keep them in agreement. See, it was that assertion that the holy scholars had to reinterpret the holy scripture to match his observations that got him in trouble with the church. It's nothing to do with the actual astronomical teachings. The truth is... Men of the cloth, like anybody, I guess, didn't like being told how to do their jobs. They felt insulted, so they threw shade on everything Galileo was teaching. And the worst part of it, that quote, that great zinger of a one-liner that people literally tattoo across their bodies, there's no evidence Galileo ever said it. It seems to be an embellishment of his story that was added later. I know, it's heartbreaking, right? 
We're going to provide links to tattoo removal services at the end of the episode. No, we're not. I'm just kidding. There's nothing worse than when facts get in the way of a good story, but that's what happens with Galileo. A lot of that stuff just didn't happen. We want our hero to be principled and awesome. We want our naysayers to be ignorant and stupid and suddenly realize how wrong they've been when Galileo drops science on them, but it just doesn't always work that way, if it ever works that way. It turns out there are a lot of reasons why scientists hear the refrain, that can't be true, that will never work, or even, you're just wrong. In fact, it often has almost nothing to do with the substance of their science. No, it's something altogether different that makes their science so unpopular. I'm Dan Riskin, and this is Inside the Breakthrough, how science comes to life. Through dramatic new discoveries in industry and agriculture, biology and medicine. We're celebrating the scientific discoveries of the past. Honest by scientific genius to benefit all mankind. So we can better understand what is happening in the world of research today. These experiments could be of tremendous importance to biologists and doctors, increasing their understanding of the processes of human life. This podcast is produced by SIMAR, a medical research group disrupting a paradigm. They're looking at new ways of doing things. Specifically, they're taking on type 2 diabetes using a hormone called HIS that comes from the liver. That approach is now in clinical trials, but getting it this far has not been easy. Dr. Wayne Lott, the founder of Symar, has been working at this for decades. And over that time, he's encountered the same kinds of obstacles that people doing groundbreaking research usually face. So in this series, we're going to look at how the great researchers of the past overcame those challenges, and we'll keep you up to speed on what Symar is doing today. This is Episode 4, Unpopular Science. <laughs> the city of Vienna, Austria gave us Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, one of the most magical composers ever to write music. It also gave us Arnold Schwarzenegger, one of the most magical men to ever take their shirt off. He went on to become Mr. Universe, the Terminator, and eventually the governor of California. But there's a third man who lived in Vienna who had an even bigger impact on humanity than either of those two. His name? Ignaz Semmelweis. But most of us have never heard of him. Heck, even in his own time, he was basically ignored. Semmelweis was a doctor in the 1840s. He worked in the maternity ward of the Vienna General Hospital. Now, there's one detail you need to know, and that is that there were actually two obstetrical clinics at the hospital. One was called the First Clinic, and the other was known as, wait for it, the Second Clinic. You can tell right away that the people running these hospitals are just a little dry. I mean, seriously, is that the best pair of names they can come up with? Anyway, Semmelweis worked at the First Clinic. To avoid overcrowding, the clinics admitted patients on alternating days. If a woman went into labor on an odd-numbered day, she gets a bed in the first clinic. If it was an even-numbered day, she goes to the second clinic. It was a completely random division of patients. But despite that, a worrying trend appeared. Now, giving birth in the mid-1800s was not exactly a safe thing to do. Infant mortality and maternal mortality were serious issues. But the pulse has changed. Too fast. Something is wrong. Prelude to the fatal fever. That's from a 1938 film called That Mothers Might Live. It actually won the Oscar for Best Short Subject. I'm going to use it to help tell this story. Almost invisible signs that doctors have come to dread. The signature of death. One of the doctor's biggest concerns was a mysterious illness called purpureal fever. It affected the mothers, even young and otherwise healthy mothers, and it wasn't clear what was causing it. Changed in 35 hours from a smiling young woman about to go home with her first baby to a still form covered with flowers. By modern standards, or any measure actually, the death rate was horrifying. In six years' time, 2,000 young mothers have been carried from this ward, and no man bothers to know how or why they die. No one knew how or why. 
but Semmelweis did notice a statistical oddity. The death rate at the second clinic was a little less than 1 in 20. Meanwhile, at the first clinic, where Semmelweis worked, it was more than double that. One out of every 10 mothers admitted there was dying. It didn't take long for word to spread. Pregnant women arriving on an odd-numbered day would beg the nurses to admit them to the second clinic instead. Tears streaming down their face, they would fall to their knees and beg for mercy. Some women, a lot actually, chose to deliver their babies in the street, claiming they were on their way to the hospital. This allowed their newborn baby to still get care without having to be admitted to the clinic for the childbirth itself. But here's the amazing part. Those street births, although they had their own complications and risks, had almost zero reports of purpureal fever. Semmelweis made it his life's mission to solve the mystery. So that here begins the search for a killer whom no one has ever seen. Semmelweis began studying all the differences between the two groups of patients. He looked at religion, age, wealth. Those characteristics were identical, as you would expect since they were randomly assigned to the two clinics. The techniques used at the two clinics were also identical. They handled the same number of patients, they had the same number of beds, they were even overseen by the same administration. The only major difference he could find was the people who worked there. The first clinic was a teaching hospital for medical students. The doctors there were studying many aspects of medicine. The second clinic? That was also a teaching facility, but it was exclusively for the instruction of midwives. That difference in staffing was the only clue Semmelweis had to work with. Midwives were almost by definition women, whereas doctors were exclusively men. But that didn't seem to be a factor. After all, how could men possibly be doing something worse than women? That was an impossible thought in an age where men had all the positions of power and prestige and women were still decades away from even being allowed to vote. No, 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 that couldn't be it. It had to be something else. One important difference that Semmelweis could see was what the doctors and midwives were doing when they were away from the patients. The medical students were also performing autopsies, sometimes on young mothers, to determine the cause of death, but also just for the purpose of studying anatomy. Midwives did not do that. The autopsies were performed in a room right next to the maternity ward, and the doctors would move back and forth between the two spaces. Still, it was unclear why something like that should make a difference. In 1847, Semmelweis's good friend and fellow doctor, Jakob Kolechka, died. Mysteriously, his dearest friend has been stricken down. He had been accidentally poked by a student's scalpel during an autopsy. Only a scratch, only a pinprick, yet large enough to form a gateway into the other world. Semmelweis performed the autopsy on his friend himself. And let me just pause for a moment to say, can you imagine doing an autopsy on your close friend? That would be a horrible experience. The only way it would be at all passable is if you felt like you were getting something very important out of the experience. Fortunately for Semmelweis, that is exactly what he got. During that examination, Semmelweis saw the same pattern of symptoms that he had seen in the women who died of purpureal fever. If this murderer can enter through a scratch, then it must be so tiny that men's eyes cannot see its shape or form. Now, purpureal fever had always been associated with childbirth, but Semmelweis adopted a new perspective. It wasn't childbirth. He theorized that particles from cadavers were transferring the disease from the dead to the living. But how does it travel from room to room, striking down sturdy young doctors and strong young mothers? He implemented a new policy mandating that all doctors between handling cadavers and treating patients must wash their hands with a chlorinated lime solution. This mixture removed the putrid smell of dead tissue and Semmelweis surmised that it might also eliminate the cadaverous material, whatever it was, that he suspected of transmitting the disease. Guess what? The infection rates went down immediately. The month before he made those changes, the death rate for birthing women at the first clinic was a horrific 18.3%. And in the month after the hand-washing rule was implemented, the death rate fell to 2.2%. 
from 18.3 to 2.2. That is a decrease of 88% immediately. Now, at this point, you probably expect that Semmelweis is touted as a hero, that they have a parade through the streets of Vienna to celebrate his discovery. At the very least, they could rename the first clinic after him, right? No. No, his theory was so simple and so singular that the rest of the medical profession mocked it. Wash your hands and save a life sounded dumb. It seemed too childish to have any scientific or medical basis. His empirical evidence that the number of deaths declined was dismissed as coincidence. Now, this would have been the perfect moment for Semmelweis to say, Et pour se mouver, mother But there's no evidence that he did. And there's also no evidence that that would have helped at all. Maybe it shouldn't be surprising that the other doctors didn't want to support his findings. I mean, if you think about it, what he's saying is washing your hands saves lives. So he's basically saying that doctors are killing patients. It's not just that they're failing to treat an illness. It's that the doctors are the reason that women are getting sick in the first place. Yes, we, the doctors who have sworn to save life, are carrying death with us at each step. And when we touch them, it leaps from our soiled fingers into our patients' hearts. We are the murderers. I mean, this is worse than when Galileo tried to tell the clergy how to do their jobs. If one of your co-workers starts calling you a murderer, you're probably going to push back against whatever they're saying. To have made your confreres look like fools. And that is the one thing men can never forgive. Semmelweis pushed on. He expanded the scope of his hygiene program. Not only hands, but all the instruments that would come into contact with patients had to be washed with the same chlorine lime solution. And a year later, purpureal fever effectively disappeared from the first clinic. But outside that one maternity ward, no one was listening. Semmelweis was not a good public speaker, nor was he much of a writer. He rarely contributed to medical journals, and even when he did, one of his students published for him. The medical profession's reaction was that the idea was just too simple to be medically valid. It is my unfortunate duty, Dr. Semmelweis, to disagree. However interesting your little experiments have been to you, they have made this staff the laughing stock of the entire medical profession. There was another problem, too. Although he was living and working in Austria, Semmelweis was Hungarian, and 1848 was the year of the Hungarian Revolution. Suddenly, Hungary and Austria were at war, so Semmelweis was removed from his position at the hospital. I must ask you for your resignation. The meeting is adjourned. He went to his native Hungary, where he became head physician at a small maternity hospital. On his first day, he found one fresh corpse, another patient in severe agony, and four others seriously ill with purpureal fever. So he introduced his hand-washing policy immediately and quickly eradicated the disease from that hospital too. But other than these two hospitals where he had worked in different parts of Europe, Semmelweis's great idea does not spread. He's unable to sway the broader medical community. Ten years later, even with a decade of evidence from two different hospitals to back him up, Semmelweis is still getting mocked. Medical men are making a joke out of the newfangled stunts. But have you forgotten, Semmelweis? That for every man who welcomes a new idea, there are a thousand to destroy it. Now, while all this is going on, Semmelweis is on his own downward spiral. He's painfully aware that every year his findings are being ignored. Thousands of women across Europe are dying needlessly. And maybe it's the guilt from all that that's getting to him. But whatever it is, his mental health was in decline. The final blow came when Rudolf Virchow, the most highly respected doctor in all of Europe, a man known as the father of modern pathology and as the Pope of medicine, dismissed his findings as childish. That was it. Semmelweis started drinking heavily. Modern doctors have suggested that maybe he was living with Alzheimer's, maybe dementia, maybe third stage syphilis. That was something that was kind of common among obstetricians at the time. Or it could have been the cumulative effect of decades of trying to convince the world of one simple fact that he could clearly see. So here's where the story gets really bad. In 1867, a fellow Hungarian doctor asked Semmelweis to accompany him on a visit to a patient living in an insane asylum. 
Semmelweis agreed, but when he arrived, he realized it had been a trick. He ran down the hall towards the door. The guards caught him. There was a fight, and Semmelweis was put in a straitjacket and locked in a padded cell. And sitting there alone, he realized that during the scuffle, he had cut his hand, but no one came to clean it or to dress the wound. It got infected. Two weeks later, he was dead. Ignaz Semmelweis was 47 years old. So did the work of one man come to its end at last. So did he die, so was he buried and forgotten. His funeral was attended by fewer than a dozen people. Semmelweis's death is sad, but that death led to even more sadness. The following year, the Hungarian hospital he'd been working at reverted to their old policies, and the death rate among young mothers spiked by 600%. The Ignaz Semmelweis story has been mythologized over the years. Just like with Galileo, people want to paint Semmelweis as a brave, bold thinker standing up to the establishment, knowing what's right when everyone around him is wrong. But in truth, the problem might have been that, well, he was a bit of a jerk. Or maybe that idea that he had this abrasive personality, maybe that got written into his myth a long time ago by the people who didn't like him. It's not outside the realm of possibility. I mean, people were looking for ways to undermine his science, so why not undermine his character? We just don't know. But all of this is an important lens to keep handy as we try to understand the truth behind all these stories where people say, we don't like your science. Every great success story on the planet has had one of these moments baked into their origin story. You can talk to the people who started Netflix or Airbnb or Uber or Apple computers and all of them will tell you about some time where someone told them they should shut it down because their idea is stupid and it will never work and then they go on to become a massive success. They tell their story that way because it's a great way to tell your story. You want to be viewed as bold and brave, a visionary. But here's the thing. Survivor bias has made those stories more popular than they should be. We only hear about the people that A, ignored the advice, and then B, flourished. But any people that didn't make it past those two checkpoints, they just sort of vanish from the stories that get told. Right? I mean, some people are told that's impossible, and then they listen. <laughs> they have this moment of sober reflection where they're like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't mortgage my house and quit my job and risk everything in my life to follow this outlandish idea. That probably happens all the time, but we don't tell those stories. And the other group of the people that didn't heed the advice, right? They pushed on with their dream, but they ended up broke sleeping on a friend's couch with nothing to show for their sacrifices. We don't tell those stories either. Well, we do tell one of those stories, and that's the story of Semmelweis. He sacrificed everything. But instead of ending up on his friend's couch, he ended up in an asylum. Actually, he ended up dead. Alone. But his story isn't a complete failure. His ideas did eventually get picked up around the world by Louis Pasteur in France, whose research laid the foundation for germ theory, and by Joseph Lister in England, who revolutionized how surgery is conducted. The knowledge belongs to other men, but the immortal idea belongs to Semmelweis. A simple man who dedicated his life to one idea, that mothers might live. Being ridiculed or dismissed or ignored, that's not just an artifact of Semmelweis's time. It still happens today. Huh? See what I did there? I took a lesson from the past and I applied it to the present? Zing! Okay, so let's use the lens we developed from those two historic stories and let's use it to look at a man with his own groundbreaking, paradigm-rattling discovery. And a man, by the way, who's also getting a lot of pushback. You know, if you're going to come up with new ideas, it's going to happen. Because a new idea means that there's an old idea that's being supplanted. That's Dr. Wayne Lott, the founder of Symar. In fact, if anything, it should be encouraging if, if the world lines up to dump on you and you know that your science is tight, that's probably a decently good sign, providing you can take a beating and still keep bleating. Dr. Lott has certainly taken a few beatings in his career, most notably in 1989. That's when he found a different way of looking at diabetes. See, if your doctor tells you you are insulin resistant, 
that means you have prediabetes. It's when the insulin produced by the pancreas seems to lose its punch. It just doesn't cause the tissues of the body to absorb glucose as well as it did in the past. Dr. Lott discovered something that was working in the opposite direction, something that would make the body insulin sensitive. He observed that the nerves in the liver were causing the tissues in the muscles, the heart, the kidneys to respond more strongly to insulin. That is, they were absorbing more glucose for the same amount of insulin. When I first made this observation, it wasn't really a discovery even, it was just an observation. It, it was just not well received. Making a person insulin sensitive is like saying you're making someone undiabetic. And up until then, that concept just didn't exist. This was the moment that Lot had to decide what group he was going to fit into. The people that heeded the naysayers or the group that pressed on. Listening to the detractors would mean ignoring what he had seen with his own eyes. But pressing on meant risking the same kind of rejection as faced by those who came before him, people like Semmelweis and Galileo. But pressing on is exactly what he did. It was such a surprising novel discovery that it had to be demonstrated in humans. And we did this study over in Portugal because I couldn't get support for it in Canada. That experiment went exactly as his hypothesis predicted it should. It showed exactly what we had shown in rats. So, I mean, that was pretty amazing and it was undeniable. Undeniable to him, but not to his critics. Despite the evidence, his concept was still largely dismissed. And the manuscript was sent back unreviewed, and it was said that the claims are so broad that if it was true, it would already be known. Just imagine making a discovery so incredible that no one believes it. How frustrating would that be? Sure, if you discover something small, this tiny refinement to a well-understood fact, people pat you on the back, but you disrupt a paradigm and skeptics come out of the woodwork. I don't think there's any advantage in having skeptics. Skepticism is a negative thing. There's a big difference between skepticism and scrutiny. I want people that are critical thinkers that are going to challenge the hypothesis, find the weakness that they can in the hypothesis, but don't be a bloody skeptic. Being a skeptic is just charging in and you know smashing wherever you can and taking up positions that are inflexible. At least with Lot, his skeptics didn't lock him in an asylum. Worse than that, they sent him to Manitoba. I'm kidding. I'm kidding, Manitoba. Uh, he already lived in Manitoba. They did not send him there. And also, Manitoba is lovely. I apologize for that joke. I apologize. Dr. Lott has one major advantage over Ignaz Semmelweis. You see, Semmelweis was largely working alone with just one small maternity ward in which to test his theories. But Lott, he has the benefit of a community, a large group of people to add to his knowledge and to test his hypotheses. We'll look at how community impacts research next time on Inside the Breakthrough, Episode 5, Diversity. And we'll continue our march toward a cure for type 2 diabetes with Dr. Wayne Lott and the team at Symar. I'm Dan Riskin. Be sure to subscribe to the series so you'll be the first to know when a new episode drops. Oh, one last thing about Galileo. Much like Semmelweis, his ideas did eventually become broadly accepted. The Catholic Church admitted they were wrong to condemn him, and they even agreed that the Bible needs to be interpreted to reflect the best knowledge of scientists. The Pope himself said, Scripture cannot err, but its interpreters and commentators can, and do so in many ways. It's a wonderful endorsement of an incredible scientist, but the only problem, that apology came from Pope John Paul II in 1992. Galileo Galilei had been dead for 350 years. Join us as we bring science to life. Listen to Inside the Breakthrough with Dan Riskin, streaming now wherever you get your podcasts. Inside the Breakthrough is an innovative podcast for scientists, science lovers, and history buffs. Host Dan Riskin of the Discovery Channel's Daily Planet expertly shares a collection of unusual and fascinating stories from the history of science. The show is produced by Symar, a research group exploring a paradigm shift in the way we treat type 2 diabetes. Learn how science comes to life with Inside the Breakthrough, now streaming on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts.